Lord, we thank you, God, for your word, for your kindness, for your mercy, Lord. God, we're grateful, God, we get a chance to, to worship you, God. And, and Lord, we're grateful, God, for the chance to hear your word. And Lord, we ask, God, that you would speak. Let, uh, let the field of our hearts and our minds be open, God, to receive everything that you have for us tonight. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I'm sure, like Vic said, there are a lot of questions swirling around the room right now, probably. Some of the things we talked about last week, and let me, you know, let me just say that, that everything we talked about last week was, I believe anyway, the, the background to what we're really looking at in Matthew chapter 24. <clears throat> and can I just say to you, this is, you know, this is, this is deep water. You know, nobody's going to deny that. This apocalyptic um, language, talking about things that are kind of shrouded in a little bit of certainly ambiguity. I, you know, I, I don't know if it's mystery or not, but it's really hard to decipher these things and 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 be dogmatic about you know making statements and saying I, I know for certain what Jesus was talking about here in Matthew 24. It's just this is this is not that kind of verse. It's not that kind of space here. You got to approach this with a lot of humility and just say you know there are some things we probably just don't know yet. But there are also some things we can we can know. And I thought Vic did a good job a couple of weeks ago of going through Matthew 24, especially the first 14 verses or so, um, and just really talking about some of the things that Jesus says they are going, that are going to happen. People are going to be falling away, and many are going to be misled. Um, and there's some... I just thought Vic did a good job of challenging or encouraging us to to hold on through those things because isn't that's really the message, isn't it? Um, it's nice to know these things and be able to talk about them and maybe you know speculate a little bit on things that are going to happen in the future. But the real goal is that we, as the church, hold on, just hold on to the end and get there. No matter what it looks like, we know it's going to be good. And we know that that's our calling and our destiny. And I think the Bible, as we'll see if we get that far tonight, we'll see that, you know, there's a real call for endurance, a call for perseverance and really getting through those hard times, the hard times of, of, of life. Life is just hard. And um, there's hard times that are, I think the Bible says are, that are ahead of us. And it's just, um, there's a call and there's a grace of God given to us to persevere and get through to the end. I'm, de I'm just trying to decide how much we want to read here. If you, if, you know, I'd love to read it all, but in the interest of time, I don't know if we can. Let's just start with Matthew 24 and just talk for a minute. You know, I think it's important to understand these, to understand these verses and these sections I think it's really important to look at the questions that are asked. When the disciples are walking with Jesus and he's departing from the temple, and they ask him a question in verse 3. Well, first of all, let's look at verse 1, because in verse 1 the disciples are looking up at the magnificent structures around them. The temple at that time was a pretty fantastic edifice from everything that I've read about it. You know, it was just a really impressive building. And Jerusalem was pretty impressive at that time. And so the disciples were looking at it and talking to Jesus about it. I don't know why. At one point in Jesus' life, he said that um, something greater than the temple was, was, was with him, was here right now. You know, he just made that comment, speaking of himself, that is, as glorious as this temple is, there's something greater than the temple here right now. Um, 
Maybe the disciples were thinking about that and thinking, well, why does he want to diss the temple? You know, why does he want to, you know, because you know, we all know they didn't understand everything he said all the time, right? And so they're just, maybe they're just asking the question. It's like, Lord, look at this. Look how, look how magnificent this is. For whatever reason, the temple was on their mind. And his response to them is that, man, as great as this is, it's all going to be torn down. It's just all, you know, stone by stone, like Vic talks about. They dug the gold out from between the stones and made sure every one of them was separated. So he wasn't exaggerating. The whole thing was torn down piece by piece. And so they say to him in verse 3, well, will you tell us when these things are going to happen? And what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? <clears throat> Certainly in the mind of a Jew- Jewish, in the, in the Jewish mind of that day, when they say, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? I'm sure that they were thinking that when that temple comes down, it's going to be the end of the age because that is life to us, man. That is, that is the, the center of our of our religious system it's the center it's you know this is the the government seat this is everything to us so certainly if you're going to say well these things are going to be torn down you're talking about the end of the age right and i think jesus goes on to say to point out and make clear to them that the end of the jewish temple is not the end of the age and he tries to impress upon them there are things that are going to be happening. There's a lot that's going to happen after the temple comes down before we get to the end of the age. In verses 4 through 14, and I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this because Vic did such a good job of talking about it already. And we have more ground to cover than we're going to get to. Oh, and by the way, I'm, I am looking at the notes from last week right now. If you're trying to find out where I am on the notes you just got, you're not going to be able to find it. Sorry. If you have your notes from last week, you can pull those out. But I know nobody brought those with them. I meant to bring more copies, and I forgot. Um, so just a couple quick thoughts about verses 4 to 14. I think it's really interesting and a key point that we're going to get to a little bit later, hopefully, and so I want to make it now. It's, it's interesting to me that when the disciples ask Jesus to tell them, when is the end of the age? What will be the sign of your coming? How will we know when you return? And when is this all going to wrap up? His, his response in all three Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, is make sure nobody deceives you. It's an, it's an interesting response, isn't it? It's like, why did you start there? That's not what I would have thought would have been the first sentence that you would have given me in answer to my question about what's the sign of the end of the age. And I just think it's fascinating that he said that that's the way he starts. Make sure, see to it, that you are not deceived, that no one misleads you, for many will come in my name. They will be trying to mislead many. Then he goes into many familiar themes and thoughts that we're you know, we all know, we've all talked about them, and we've all said, hey, man, there's wars and rumors of wars, and there's earthquakes going on all over the place. Certainly the end is close, right? I think, I know I've said that in the past. I'm pretty sure most of us have. And now I've come to understand that I think what Jesus is saying here is not that those things will be a sign of the end. In fact, he comes right out and says, those are not the signs of the end. <laughs> I don't know. I missed that part before somehow. Um, I think what he's doing in these verses in 4 to 14 is he's just saying, you know, you're in, a, you're in a current age. Paul writes in Galatians 1, and he calls it a, the current evil age. This age in which we live is described by the apostle as an evil time. I think what Jesus is doing here. And these verses that Vic talked about in 4 to 14 is describing some of the things you can expect to happen during this this current evil age. There will be wars. There will be rumors of wars. There will be famine. There will be earthquakes. 
and um, you know Luke and Mark even give a little bit different spin on it. Luke says that the sea will will actually roar and and men's hearts will faint and fail them because of the roaring of the seas. And there, these things have been with us for a long time. And I think Jesus is just saying, you can expect these things. And it's during that time, it's during that season, in verse 9, he starts with the word then. It's then, during that time, that you can expect people to deliver you up. You can expect trouble. And you can expect to be hauled before governors and kings and, and drugged before courts during this evil age. So I think he's just really giving them, clarifying their expectation maybe as a way to say it, of what's, what they can look for in this in the age in which they were living and this in the age in which we're living. There's a couple of interesting points in verse 12. I don't know if you guys have a, your Bibles open. Actually, in verse 10, let's start there. It says, At that time many will fall away and will betray one another and hate one another. Many false prophets will arise and will mislead many. And because lawlessness is increased, most people's love will grow cold. The really sad thing about these verses to me is that they are written and spoken in the context of the community of faith, in the community of the disciples. The context here is that Jesus is talking to his disciples. He's not talking to the world. When he talks about people falling away, he's not talking about the world falling away. He's talking about disciples falling away from the faith. Many are going to do it, unfortunately. And the really sad thing is, is that it's those people who will turn, who will turn on and betray the, the other disciples. And that's what he's really saying. Their love is going to grow cold. Now, whether he's talking about their love for one another, their love for the people of faith, their love for God, I don't know. Their love just grows cold. Their lawlessness increases. Their love grows cold. And they turn on the community of faith. That's sad to me. It's, really, it's sad that they fall away. It's sad that um, they turn and, and bite the, you know, the, the people of God. And then he says at the end of that, the one who endures will be saved. Well, it calls for endurance, doesn't it? It calls for supernatural love when people fall away and they betray us and they, you know, and they uh, do things to harm us. The endurance is to love them anyway, to show love and be the people of faith and the people of God and act like Jesus who loved the people who were crucifying him. You know, love, love like that is a challenge. But it's the one who endures. It's the one who doesn't give up. That will, that will be saved in the end. And then he makes another familiar comment. It's familiar to all of us. He's, in verse 14, he says, The gospel of the kingdom shall be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. The gospel of the kingdom is the good news of the kingdom. When Jesus sent his disciples out, he would tell them, Go, go into... Um, Israel, Go to all the cities and every city you come to. Just tell them that the kingdom of God is drawn near. The kingdom of God is coming to their midst. And if you can, cast out demons, heal people, raise the dead, and tell them this is the kingdom of God. It, it has come. It, is, it has come and touched their lives and it has drawn near. And it's good news. The good news is that the kingdom of God is near and it's drawing near and it's coming. And that's the message that we have. What this verse is not meant to do is to predict the time of the end, which is, again, it's a way that a lot of people want to use it. They, you know, I mean, you, again, we've all heard somebody say, maybe ourselves, well, as soon as the gospel is preached everywhere, the end will come. That's what, you know, because that's what this is saying. That's not what it's really saying. It just says what Jesus means is that before the end of this age, 
The gospel will be for more than just Israel. The gospel will be proclaimed to every nation, to every tribe and every tongue. It will go everywhere because the good news of the kingdom is for everybody. So we cannot use it to try to predict when the end of the age will come. We just, our, our mandate here and in chapter 28 of Matthew is that we, as the children of God, are to take that message to all the nations and we're to proclaim it or everyone to see, or everyone to hear. All right, I think I can go to your notes that you have in front of you at this point. We can pick up in verse 15. Interesting verses. There's definitely a transition that's made in verse 15. It starts with a therefore, which means to me that Jesus is saying, um, yeah, I'm making a transition here, but what I'm about to say proceeds from everything that we just talked about and goes forward from here with another thought. The therefore means that because we're living in this evil age, because we're living in a time when you can anticipate and expect tough times, then you can look for this thing called an abomination of desolation. Big long, two big long words that we all know how to say and it makes us sound smart when we say it and most of the time we have no idea what we're saying. Matthew and Mark both talk about this as being an identifying sign of impending trouble. That's what it really is saying. Jesus says, when you see this, run for the hills because there's trouble coming. What does it really mean? The abomination of desolation is, is language that comes from the book of Daniel. The prophet Daniel used the terminology in three places, chapters 9, 11, and 12. And he was referring to a time when the regular sacrifice of God would be set aside for the worship of something else, anything. The term could really be described as a, a desecrating sacrilege or it, 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 something that comes and desecrates or destroys the real worship of God for a sacrilegious kind of worship, the worship of something that ought not to be worshipped. Now, to a Jew, certainly that would be, you know, um, anything other than the worship of Yahweh, right, or the worship of Jehovah. And... Um, several hundred years after Daniel wrote this, there was uh, a, a, a historical event that I'm sure they would have thought of being the fulfillment of Daniel's prophecy. Vic talked about it a couple weeks ago a little bit. And a guy named Antiochus, um, a Greek general who became one of the four rulers of the, of the Greek dynasty when it was split up into four, actually came into Jerusalem, put a stop to the worship of, of Jehovah, the worship of God. And he set up a desecrating uh, form of worship. He actually offered a pig on the, on the, on the Jewish altar and um, set up worship to Olympian Zeus. But he thought of himself as the earthly manifestation of Zeus. So he was really setting up worship to himself. Certainly any Jew living at that time thought, would have thought, that's a desecrating sacrilege, right? That's an abomination. And so they would have thought, well, we just saw Daniel 9, 11, and 12 fulfilled. And in a way it was. But a couple hundred years later, when Jesus is talking to his disciples here in Matthew 24, he says, when you see the abomination that Daniel wrote about, run for the hills. Well, you know, the disciples could have said, well, what do you mean when we see it? It already happened. It happened a couple hundred years ago. Antiochus, you know the story. Antiochus did all this stuff, right? But Jesus is saying, no, there's, an, there's something else coming that's going to look like that too. Now, what was that? 
you know, there's a lot of speculation about it. Um, Jesus would have been saying these things sometime around 32, 33 A.D., and around 40 A.D., just seven years later, there was, a, a, you know, a guy named Gaius who came into Jerusalem and um, talked about putting up a statue in the temple, and the Jews... The Jews of the day actually thought, well, here we go. Here comes the abomination, and, uh, you know, we have instructions to run, so let's get out of Jerusalem. Let's get out of town. A lot of them did. The only problem is this, the, temp- the statue was never put into the temple. A few short years later, actually about 26 years later, there was the Romans are still occupying Judea, still in control of Jerusalem, and a group of guys called the Zealots actually um, raised up a resistance. And believe it or not, they were kind of able to drive the Romans out of Judea and out of Jerusalem. But they were at odds with some of the other Jewish people in the town. And so there were these different factions. Imagine this in Israel, you know, different factions of people, right? It's it's not hard to imagine, is it? Um, and the zealots, in an effort to kind of gain ascendancy over the other factions of Jews within Jerusalem at that time, took control of the inner temple. You know, the holy place where they're not supposed to be. Some people look at that and say, well, aha, there's, a, there's our sacrilege. There's our abomination of desolation. That might be the fulfillment of it. And then three years later, because of the resistance of the zealots and because of the rebellion against Rome, Rome sends Titus to Jerusalem to quell all the resistance and, and, um, you know, and bring things back to order. And that's when... They, Rome was just kind of done with Israel at that point. They were just kind of done with with Jerusalem and Judea, and that's when he just burned it down and and destroyed the whole thing. A lot of people look at those events and say, well, the abomination that Jesus was talking about was satisfied and during those that time. We have some problems, you know, trying to say that it was fulfilled literally. Mark, in particular, uh, talks about when he, he does a really funny thing in the Greek language. Jesus said, when you see the abomination standing where it ought not to be or standing in the holy place, you you know that it's time to run, okay? It's time to, to get out of town. Matthew followed typical Greek grammar and used a neutral form of the word standing. Greek verbs have what they call gender. If a, if a female is doing something, you use the feminine form of the noun. If, if a male is doing something, you use the masculine form of the noun. You don't even say he or she. They don't use the pronouns. I know a, a guy is doing the action if, if the noun is in its masculine form. In a neutral form, it could mean an object is just standing there. It could have been a statue or something. Mark used the masculine form of standing. So Mark is specifically saying, when you see a man standing where he ought not to be, that's the abomination of desolation. That's that's the sign. Matthew just used the neutral form. Luke didn't say anything about it. Luke just said, when you see the armies surrounding Israel, it's time to get out of town. So we could kind of say, well, Luke's Luke's words are fulfilled. Certainly the armies of, of Rome surrounded Israel. They were surrounding it for three years, trying to put down this resistance. Uh, you, you know, Titus had, and the Romans had to go back to Rome and deal with some issues there a few times and then come back. But in, in general for three years Israel was surrounded by the armies of of Rome so you could say well Luke was describing that Matthew's words could be fulfilled you don't have to have a guy standing in the the temple 
But Mark is interesting. Mark talks about, you know, you got to see a guy standing in there. Now, why the three of them did it that way, why they all said it differently, we'll never know. Well, we may know someday, but we, don't, we won't know now. Um, Paul, in his writings to the Thessalonians, talks about a man of lawlessness in 2 Thessalonians 2. He says, there's, there's a day coming when a man of lawlessness, lawlessness will exalt himself and try to take the worship onto himself. That day has to still be becoming according to Paul. When you put all these pieces together, what this what it really says to me is that these things it is really hard to take the words of Jesus as they're found in those three gospels and come away with some definitive time and say they're talking about that time or they're talking about this time and that's why we have all the speculation what is what was it was he really talking about now I think when we do that we're making a mistake actually I believe that the word of God is alive and active like it says it is I believe that the, the, the best approach at looking at the um, at, at, at apocalyptic language like this and probably all scripture for that matter is to say that it's quite possible that everybody's right here. It's quite possible that Matthew, Mark, and Luke are all, are all right. Sorry. I always forget to mute my phone. Um, the scripture I, I don't think we should try to force the scriptures into our systems or into our our ideas and try to you know make it fit something I think the scriptures are clearly used in such a way um, as to say well things have could have fulfillment now and a later fulfillment then. An example of that that I have in the notes is Hosea 11.1. 1. You know, we, I think I've talked about this before. It, it simply says that out of Egypt I called my son. Now Hosea, when he wrote it, he was certainly thinking about God pulling Israel out of Egypt after they had been there for 430 years. But the New Testament writers applied that to Jesus when he came back from Egypt as a as a little boy because Joseph had taken him there to get him away from Herod who wanted to kill him and after Herod died Jesus comes back from Egypt and the scripture from Hosea 11 is applied to Jesus again out of Egypt I called my son certainly anybody living between those two events would have thought Hosea 11 one is fulfilled you know it's done but it wasn't done there's another example found in Isaiah 7. I don't even know if I'm following my notes at this point. I'm just kind of talking. I apologize if you're having trouble keeping up there. In Isaiah 7, you know, the, there's a very familiar verse. It says, Behold, a virgin or maiden will be with child and bear a son. Before the boy will know enough to refuse evil and choose good, the land whose two kings you dread will be forsaken what this is about. Ahaz was king of Judah at the time. There was a guy named Rezin who was king of Damascus and a guy named Pekah was king of Israel. Remember the kingdoms were divided during Isaiah's day. Well Rezin the king of Damascus and Pekah the king of Israel kind of joined forces. And what they were really trying to do was get strong enough to resist Assyrian uh, control are being taken over by Assyria. But at the same time, they thought, well, you know what, we ought to just go up and conquer, or go down and take Jerusalem away from, uh, yeah, from Ahaz and Judah, too. Why don't we just go do that? So Ahaz is kind of worried about this. He's got, you know, he has two kings united who are coming to try to take his city. And the, the prophet Isaiah comes to him and tells him, gives him those words. Don't worry about it. God says, don't worry about those guys. B 
before they, before they can ever come and take you over, a virgin or a maiden is going to have a child and bear a son. And before he's old enough to choose good or evil, those two kings who you dread are going to be forsaken. Well, Rezin was executed in 732, and Pika was assassinated about the same time. So the two kings were killed, and they were not able to come and take Jerusalem away from Ahaz. And so the words of Isaiah the prophet were fulfilled, right? And if we'd have been living then, let's say we're living 40, 50, 100, 200 years later, and we're reading Isaiah 7, and we're arguing. We could be standing here arguing just like we're arguing or maybe arguing is not the best word, but there's, there's, there are arguments about this, believe me. Um, discussing. We could be discussing Isaiah 7 and saying, well, do you think it's over yet? Um, yeah, I think maybe it is. You know, when Rezin and Pika and those guys were doing their thing, I think maybe, but it says a virgin's going to have a baby. What, what does that mean? I don't know, but... It can't mean what you think it means. I mean, that, that's impossible. So that, I, I don't know what it means, but, you know, you, you, get, you get my point? We could have had lengthy discussion for our whole life about whether Isaiah 7 was fulfilled or whether it was not. Today, fast forward into 2021, where we are, we know that those words had another fulfillment when Christ was actually born to a virgin. Right? What am I saying? I'm saying that right now, I think with Matthew 24, we're between those events. We're between events that certainly look like they have some historical fulfillment of the abomination of desolation. The events of 167, when Antiochus was in Jerusalem. Um, am, am I making that noise? We're between those events, and I think what will probably be the final event, and we can discuss this till the cows come home, like they say, and we're just like people living between the time when Pika and Rezin did their thing and Jesus was born. We're like people living in between those two events trying to figure out whether Isaiah 7 is fulfilled or not. You get my point? They would have never... They would have never come to the point of saying, oh, no, there's a future fulfillment. There's a girl who's going to be living in Israel at that time, and she's going to have a baby without, you know, without any human intervention. She's just going to be a virgin with a child. And, and he's going to be called Emmanuel because he's going to be God's son. We would have never arrived at that conclusion until it happened. And so my point is, two points really, I think these, this kind of language, biblical, prophetic, and apocalyptic language, can have multiple fulfillment. Okay? The second point is, we can talk till the cows come home, and we will not know how exactly how Matthew 24 is going to be fulfilled until it happens. But I am of the opinion that Matthew 24 has an ultimate fulfillment. Yeah, it has been somewhat fulfilled. Not exactly, because what Mark was looking for and what Paul seems to be looking for and what the book of Revelation seems to be looking for. Revelation 13 talks about um, the beast, uh, a beast who gets his power and authority from Satan and he comes and tries to set up a sacrificial system so that the whole world set, worships him. I have no idea what that's going to look like. I, it's in my Bible, and I don't think it's ever happened. I don't think historically you can point at anything and say, well, that's already been done. Paul says that these things cannot happen until the great falling away or the great apostasy takes place first. That's in Second Thessalonians. I don't think that's happened yet. I can't see that. So... My position on these things is that, yes, they have had some historical fulfillment. To the people living during the days of Antiochus, there was an abomination of desolation. To the people living in 
the days of um, t- uh, yeah of Titus and the the zealots and the destruction of Jerusalem, there was an abomination of desolation. There was a desecrating sacrilege when the temple's occupied by a bunch of zealots, a bunch of guys carrying knives who were just all about killing people. And they're not priests. They shouldn't be in the holy place. They're desecrating the temple. And yet, there's other fulfillment to come. You guys tracking with me? And I think, that's my point is, I think when we try to force the scriptures to say one way or the other, that yeah, that's been fulfilled, or it has not been fulfilled, we're, we're, we're forcing something on the scriptures that we shouldn't force on it. It's living. The words of Christ had real relevance to the people of, of A.D. 70. In fact, in, in 66, when the zealots were just kind of rising up and starting to fight against the, the Romans... There, there was, there was a, a word circulating among the Christians to get out of town. And a lot of them did. And a lot of them lived because they weren't in town when Rome came and burned it down. So it saved lives. The words of Christ right here saved lives and got the Christians away from the city. So you would say, well, yeah, it really accomplished a purpose then, didn't it? It was relevant to those people. Is it relevant to us? Yes. If you see something that looks like a desecrating sacrilege or you see something being set up that just looks really wrong to you, you should probably get out of town. Because the warning is relevant no matter when it happens. Now I want to go to something that, you know, we, last week we talked about this, this, uh, <clears throat> excuse me, this cosmic worldview about... Um, the sons of God, and here we go again. <laughs> there are these divine beings who are ruling the nations. Okay, I'll just go that way. <clears throat> I think Genesis 1 through 11 sets this whole thing up for us, and it, and it sets the stage for it. I think we see it in, you know, in Daniel, in Daniel 10, and we see when Paul talks about world forces of darkness and spiritual forces of wickedness ruling in the heavenly places. I think Paul's talking about those divine beings who are ruling over the nations. The Apostle John says, the whole world lies under the power of the, of the evil one. Well, those are some radical statements to, to make unless you really believe it, right? So the Apostles thought that, yeah, there's, there's something wicked ruling it's the power. It's up in the air. It's, it's the power of the air, and it's forces of evil, forces of wickedness. Um, and they're reigning and ruling. Well, if, if our worldview that we talked about last week is that God actually put these guys over the nations, and there's, there's a lot of language in the Bible that talks about God giving the people to the gods, and then he gave the gods to the people. He allotted, he allocated it out. He separated the people and put them all under the authority of these these lesser gods. And if that worldview is correct and they really are ruling, it makes sense to me that they would try to set desecrate the, the true worship of God several times throughout history, doesn't it? I mean it just makes sense that they would continually be about that that's what their fault was in the beginning they took their they took god's worship to themselves and they continue to try to do that and we are headed towards i think the bible tells us that we're headed towards this big cosmic showdown when this this beast who receives authority and power from the dragon who is satan tries to get the whole world to worship him and jesus comes back and puts an end to it. We're headed for that, that showdown. That will be the ultimate abomination of desolation. That, and, and I think that's what the scriptures is telling us. And so I can see these, these, these types of things. When, I, when you read Matthew 24 and, that, and, and these types of verses, 
don't try to force on it something that it's that can't be forced on it. Just you know, I think we just need to understand the words of Jesus were relevant to the people of seventy, they're relevant to us, and they'll be very relevant to the people who are alive when some of these events start to unfold, as they're explained by Paul and John in in the Revelation and Jesus here. They're just relevant. I want to make I want to just talk about a principle because what Jesus does after talking about this abominable time and I'm going to kind of fast forward to verse 29 he says immediately after the tribulation of those days because there's an associated tribulation that comes with this with these powers of darkness every time they try to you know set worship up to themselves it's hard on the people who are living at those times there's a, there's always an associated tribulation that comes with that and then Jesus says immediately after those times there's a there's a judgment that comes you will see this the the, the signs in the heaven the, the the sign of the son of man you'll see the, the moon and the stars there'll be signs in the stars the sun will be dark and the moon will not give its light and the stars will fall to the earth. Well, guess what, guys? Stars don't, are not going to fall to... Most of them are bigger than the earth. You can't have multiple stars falling to this earth. It just is physically impossible. That's not what it's talking about. That type of language is used um, in the scripture and especially in apocalyptic kind of language to refer to powers, to, you know, the... the the, a very key verse in Deuteronomy 4 is in verse 19 it talks about the uh, sons of God it, it refers to the sons of God these divine beings that we've been talking about the last couple of weeks as stars in the heavens um, there, there are verses that talk about in Isaiah 13 and Isaiah 24 it talks about the sun and the moon when in Isaiah 13, the prophet's writing about a, a pending judgment on Babylon, and his description of that judgment contains the words that Jesus is drawing from here, and it talks about the sun being dark as a sackcloth and the moon turning to blood. And so I think those, that kind of language is used to describe judgment because judgment always entails punishment not only on the people but on the gods of the people in Exodus 12 Moses is, is writing God speaking to Moses in Exodus 12 about the judgments that he's going to bring on on Egypt and he says right there I'm going to bring judgment on both man and beast and on the gods of Egypt there's always these associated gods with with wickedness, with wicked people, there's the, you can't you cannot separate evil on the earth from the associated evil in the heavens. And so, when God brings judgment, He brings judgment on both against the gods and against the people. And certainly, there was a judgment on Israel in A.D. seventy. I mean, holy cow, the city is burned to the ground. The temple's torn down stone by stone. That is judgment. And I think what Jesus is, t is letting us know here when he says, you know, when he describes it in these kind of astral terms and saying the sun is going to be dark and the moon won't give off its light, he's just letting us know, too, that there will be judgment against the gods. The, the gods probably of Rome, the gods of, of Israel who have led the people astray. In the, in the previous chapter of Matthew, in chapter 23, Jesus talks about Israel and Jerusalem and says, why do you guys always kill the prophets and those who are sent to you? And you refuse to accept the Messiah who's come to you. Well, there are, when people are that deceived, there are, they're, they're being helped. Paul talks about the God of this world deceiving and blinding people's minds so that they can't see the idea the, the glory of Christ. So it's, you know, you can, there's, it's hard to know where to put the blame, even. 
Does the blame lie with the person? Often when God says, you know what, the Bible will talk about God like putting a stupor over people. And in uh, Romans 10 and 11, that, you know, the famous section about Israel and whether all of Israel is under a stupor and they'll all be saved in the end and who's, what's, what is the real problem. In chapter 10, it talks about Israel having stubborn hearts. God says, all day long I've stretched out my arms to an obstinate and stubborn people. You just won't bend. And then in chapter 11, it says, God, will God put a stupor over their minds? He partially hardened their minds so that they couldn't see. Which one is it? Are they stubborn and obstinate, or did God just blind their eyes so they can't see? I believe that that kind of hardening from God and that kind of uh, blindness that comes over people, you could say it comes from God, but if you look at and you follow, track it up in the scriptures, what you'll find is it's always put on people who are already stubborn. The Bible says God hardened Pharaoh's heart, right? Well, Pharaoh was already stubborn, and God needed to judge him, and so he hardened his heart because he had to bring judgment on Pharaoh and on the gods of Egypt in order for it to play him. But Pharaoh was not this compliant, God-fearing man, and God just decided to harden his heart. He was already stubborn and obstinate. And so it's kind of like a judgment that God just gives you over to the hardness of your own heart. I think that's what happened. I think that's what Paul's saying happened to Israel in, in Romans 10 and 11. Are we doing too much? Are you guys still able to follow a little bit? Let's see. <clears throat> Let me just make this point, because going back to something we talked about earlier, there are great, I think there are great times of distress ahead. When the Bible talks about, you know, this, the, the final tribulation, and it talks about the beast, you know, that I've mentioned a few times, there are things said about him, like he's given the power to overcome the saints. He's given power. He, he wages war against the saints, and he's given the power to overcome them. And things are going to get so hard that Jesus talks about the days being shortened in that great tribulation. The days will be shortened. It's interesting to me that Daniel... And Revelation 13 both talk about a period of time. Daniel, Daniel and, and Revelation both talk about a period of three and a half years. 42 months, 1,260 days, time, times, and half a time. However you want to say it, it comes up to 42 months, three and a half years. They all talk about it. And you could say, well, is that a long time or a short time? Well, when Jesus says that the tribulation is going to be so bad and so many people are going to be falling away and so many false prophets are going to arise again from within the church, not from out there. The false prophets come up from within the church. There's going to be so many of them leading people astray that those days had to be shortened. Well, maybe the three and a half month, years, the 42 months, means that's all the time they get. That's when they're cut off, and, that, and that's it. because if it, if, it was, if it extended on, nobody would make it. So during times of distress, what are people doing? They're looking for answers, right? It's, it, it's a tactic. It was Hitler's tactic. It was Stalin's tactic. It is a tactic of darkness and a tactic of what I would just refer to as... Um, overly ambitious I want to say sick people certainly they're overly ambitious but it's a tactic of tactic of darkness that when you want to take something over and you want to get people to a point of looking to you for answers or looking to you for help you just create havoc among them just 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 create chaos get things so messed up that people don't know what they're doing and all they want is they just want somebody to make it right and then you can show up and say, I know how to make this right. All right. And if, and if you do that with enough confidence, 
you'll have people follow you, right? So it's during the times of tribulation and chaos and havoc that people are vulnerable. And I think when Jesus is, when the disciples are talking to Jesus and, uh, and, they, and they're, they're asking him, well, when are all these things going to happen? When are these tough times going to come? You're talking about our city being destroyed. You're, you know, you're talking about things, that, you know, when the end, at the end of the age. And Jesus says, make sure you don't get deceived. It's because he knows you're going to be vulnerable right at that point. There's some enthusiasm. <laughs> So, did I make that point clearly? It's at moments of, to of confusion and chaos and tribulation and challenges that people are looking for answers. And there are guys who are opportunists who rise up and say, I have answers. You want to have ans you want, you want to You want to be okay? Follow me. And, G and the warning from Jesus is that many people are going to go that way and, and be led astray. So what, what do we do? Well, we want to know the word of God, right? And Jesus, very interestingly, at the end of that section there says, I've told you in advance. I've warned you. These guys are going to come. They're going to even have signs and wonders. And guess what? It's not just going to be... The guy will sit here and call fire down from heaven and amaze people. They're going to have signs and wonders that are relevant to the time. That's what's going to be so deceptive about it. You need answers. I have answers. Signs and wonders. The beast, the false prophet in the book of Revelation, is given power from Satan to perform signs and wonders, to deceive people. So the signs of wonders will be very relevant. They won't just be abstract uh, phenomena. They're going to be relevant to the time, and they're going to look like an answer when people are looking for answers. So our defense is to know the Word of God, yeah. to be grounded and rooted in, in the Word and rooted in Christ. And that's why we read stuff like this and, and, and wrestle through it and, and try to, you know, um, we try to understand it, try to understand why is, why is it here and why did, what does Jesus want us to get out of this? And another interesting point, I think this is really interesting actually, is that the scripture says, you know, when Jesus says there's going to be guys coming along and trying to mislead many, Paul talks about it quite a bit. And he talks about at the time of the end, there will be um, many people coming, false prophets arising. And we see some of the problems, the types of problems they will create. There are examples of these problems in the scripture. Paul says there's already guys out there saying that things have already happened. There's, there are teachers out there saying the resurrection has already taken place. There are teachers out there saying the day of the Lord has already come. Well, that's interesting to me. It's interesting that that would be the context within this context of apocalyptic, prophetic, futuristic kind of language. The Lord's warning and Paul's identification of problems within the church is that people are coming and saying some of this stuff has already happened. Don't fall for it. Jesus said don't fall for it. Don't go for that. If they come and tell you I'm here, I'm back, or he's back, don't believe it. You will know when it happens. It'll be like lightning going from the east to the west. You can't miss it. You will know. It's just really interesting to me that part of the problem then and part of the problem will be people saying, some of this stuff has already happened. I won't say any more about it. Give us some thought. Um, let's quit there. I can tell. We've gone over more than we can handle already, probably.
Let's just pray and um, we can dismiss. Lord, we are humbled by your word. Lord, we are, we are confident that your word is alive and relevant. Lord, I know that you, you are so wise that you were able to speak words that were relevant to the people listening. You're, and those words can still be relevant to us. Relevant to people beyond our days, even, God. And we're just in awe of your word. The magnitude of your understanding and of your wisdom is just beyond us. And um, we worship you, God, as the God of all creation, the God of... We know that in the end of all things, Jesus comes to inherit a kingdom. He, he receives dominion and inherits a kingdom and reigns and rules on the earth. And we are grateful for that, God. We are grateful for that promise and for that hope. We're grateful that you've called us to be part of it, Lord. And we just pray that you would seal our hope and our faith in our hearts. Lead us in a knowledge of your will and an understanding of these things, Lord, we pray. And I just pray you bless every family that's here tonight, God, and watch over each and every one of them. In Jesus' name, amen.